And again, as a reminder, the remarks um, made from the podium will be on the record, as will uh, the questions and answers. Uh, Josh, could I ask you, Josh Rogan, since I gave you a question, could you please sit down so that the speakers can actually speak? I do recognize enough people in this room to be able to embarrass them publicly if they repeatedly don't follow the instructions uh, of the chair. And you've just lost your question rights for uh, plenary two, uh, since we need time to have them posed. And for that, we have to begin uh, as uh, scheduled. Uh, the second plenary session uh, is on uh, Korean security, uh, the next steps. And as we were reminded of in the first plenary addressed by Acting Secretary of Defense Patrick Shanahan, uh, the question of Korean security has been one of the biggest issues in Asia-Pacific uh, relations and one on which uh, the United States and others have called on friends, partners and allies uh, to support uh, a diplomatic solution to that uh, challenge. Uh, we're delighted in this second plenary to be hearing uh, in order uh, John kyung Du, the Minister of National Defense uh, of the Republic uh, of Korea, uh, who is uh, attending his uh, first uh, Shangri-La Dialogue, um, and then uh, Takeshi Iwaya, uh, the Minister of Defense of uh, Japan. Uh, since the first IISS dialogue in 2002, the Japanese defense uh, ministers have had a perfect record of attendance, uh, 18 uh, addresses by Japanese defense ministers at 18 Shangri-La dialogues, and I thank you, uh, Iwaya-san, for uh, continuing that uh, excellent record. And we're delighted to welcome again to the IISS Shangri-La dialogue Federica Mogherini, the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, and also, uh, importantly, uh, Vice President of the European Commission. She uh, came to address the Shangri-La Dialogue in her first year as Vice President, uh, and this is her concluding uh, year as Vice President of the European Commission. So the Shangri-La Dialogue has served as uh, bookends for her uh, distinguished career representing European uh, foreign policy uh, internationally. Uh, so with that um, preface, may I uh, invite uh, the Minister of National Defense of Korea to take the podium and address uh, the Shangri-La Dialogue on Korean security, the next steps. Thank you, sir. Nice to meet you all. I'm Minister Jang from the Republic of Korea. First of all, I would like to extend my words of gratitude to Dr. Chinmin and IISS for scheduling a plenary session on the Korean Peninsula at the world-renowned Shangri-La Dialogue. In the previous session, Secretary Shanahan gave remarks on the important topic of peace, stability, and prosperity of Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. I'd like to ask for your full incorporation of experiences in the civil sector for the peace and prosperity of Asia Pacific region. Furthermore, it is an honor for me to have this opportunity to speak about the Korean Peninsula and its next step with your excellencies and accomplished security experts from all around the world. With the three inter-Korean summits and two U.S.-North Korean summits serving as a turning point, the situ security situation of the Korean Peninsula is, is undergoing dynamic changes towards solving the North Korean nuclear threat, building confidence and easing tensions between the two Koreas. Today, I would like to explain the efforts to achieve denuclearization and the establishment of permanent peace of the Korean Peninsula pursued by the Republic of Korea government within the ongoing changes of the security environment around the peninsula and to introduce new Korean Peninsula regime to be heralded by these efforts. Next year marks the 70th year since the beginning of the Korean War, which left the deepest scar in the modern history of Republic of Korea. 
Even after signing the armistice agreement in 1953, military tension, conflict, and confrontation continued on the Korean Peninsula. In particular, North Korea's North nuclear pursuits have been a serious challenge and threat to the peace and stability of not only the Korean Peninsula, but also the international community. Since the Moon administration set sail, however, the Republic of Korea has been able to find a ray of hope within the seemingly insurmountable clouds of war by improving inter-Korean relations and pursuing diplomatic solutions aimed at solving the nuclear threat. Now, the Republic of Korea is facing a watershed point that will echo throughout our 5,000-year-long history. Our grand journey, while laden with difficulties for the establishment of permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula, has begun. Through the 2018 Panmunjom Declaration and the Pyongyang Joint Declaration, President Moon and Chairman Kim have agreed on complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and the establishment of a permanent peace regime, alleviation of military tensions, and practical mitigation of the risk of war and the broad and groundbreaking development of inter-Korean relations. In fact, the U.S.-North Korea summit that took place right here in Singapore a year ago had been a historical meeting where President Trump and Chairman Kim agreed on the complete denuclearization of the peninsula and the improvement of bilateral relations as well as mutual cooperation for the peace of the Korean Peninsula and the world. While it is regrettable that the second U.S.-North Korea summit held in Hanoi last February with the high hopes from the international community has stopped short of an agreement, I find much meaning in that the two leaders were able to reaffirm their resolve for denuclearization, have an open, open and candid discussions with regards to their interests, and agree to continue the dialogue. In this perspective, the current denuclearization dialogue between the U.S. and North Korea is clearly different from the past denuclearization talks of the last 30 years that had missed their mark. While there may be more difficulties like the present into the future, these difficulties will surely be overcome as a part of an important step towards denuclearization. In order to hold on to this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for denuclearization, it is important to continue the maintaining the momentum, momentum of dialogue generated through the summit talks. A variety of measures must also be considered to provide North Korea with assurance of a bright future of peace and prosperity. The said measures would proceed within a framework agreed upon by the international community like the United Nations Security Council resolutions. The Republic of Korea government will collaborate closely with the international community to achieve complete denuclearization and the establishment of permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula, and it will make every effort for North Korea to take brave steps toward a new future of peace and prosperity. As the Minister of National Defense in charge of the security of our nation, I will actively support diplomatic efforts for denuclearization while maintaining a seamless combined defense posture. Permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula, together with denuclearization, is only achievable when the 7 year long fear and anxiety of war between South and North Korea is overcome and when military tension is alleviated and confidence is built. Last September, the agreement of the implementation of the historic Panmunjom Declaration in the military domain, also known as Comprehensive Military Agreement, was signed by the Minister of National Defense of the Republic of Korea and the Minister of the People's Armed Forces of North Korea in Pyongyang, serving as the first steps toward the establishment of permanent peace. The foundation of this agreement is comprised of the basic spirit of the 1953 Armistice Agreement in preventing armed confrontations of the peninsula as well as the contents of previous inter-Korean agreements in the military domain. It includes practical measures to comprehensively halt acts of aggressions toward each other. On the post-war Korean Peninsula, the 155-mile-long military demarcation line was stretched coast to coast, and the demilitarized zone enveloped the MDL as a buffer 2 kilometers north and south, 4 kilometers total of the line. The two Koreas have ceased mutual aggression in all domains including land, air, and sea since last November. The DMZ is also undergoing actual demilitarization, transforming into a zone of peace. 
an agreement was reached to withdraw all guarded posts installed at key points with the, within the DMZ. The two sides have withdrew an initial group of 11 GPs each last year and completed joint verification. In addition, the, Korea, the two Koreas have completed the militarization of measures such as removing all firearms and installing joint guard posts in the Panmunjom Joint Security Area, an area known for its symbolic representation of the revision of the peninsula. When free movements across JSA commences, Panmunjom will be reborn as a symbol of peace and harmony. Furthermore, in our areas within the DMZ that includes territory from both Koreas, recovery of war remains has commenced for the first time since the division. This area has seen the deaths of countless young men and women in fierce battles between the two Koreas and many other participating nations. While access was restricted for all ever since the uh, armistice agreement uh, was signed in 1953, an intergrain agreement to jointly pursue recovery has brought newfound attention. In support of the joint remains recovery, the two Koreas have demined the area, laid roads connecting each other within the DMZ. The Republic of Korea has begun recovery efforts first as a means of preparing for joint recovery, leading to the identification of approximately 400 remains. Recently, items of various nationalities surviving their owners, such as identification tag of a French soldier who fell during battle, U.S. body armor, and a Chinese gas mask have been found. I hope that the two Koreas can soon jointly undertake the noble task of returning all of our heroes that were left behind for the last 70 years to their homelands and families and expand this project across the entire DMZ. Furthermore, the Republic of Korea government has not stopped at just implementing the CMA but also constructed and opened DMZ peace trails in vicinity of the DMZ, creating opportunities to experience peace at the heart of the division. The reasons that the CMA is set apart from past agreements is that rather than limiting itself to a declarative purpose, it makes tangible contributions for the alleviation of military tensions and confidence building between the two Koreas. This has allowed for a more stable management of inter-Korean military relations than ever before. Efforts will continue for complete denuclearization and establishment of permanent peace on the Korean Peninsula through the meticulous implementation of the CMA, making sure that the heightened military tensions, crisis, and friction of the past will not be repeated. The Korean Peninsula will push on towards an era of peace and prosperity, taking persistent strides to transcend its history of division in preparation of reunif reunification. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the provis Provisional Government of the Republic of Korea, which was a declaration of our independence through the establishment of a Provisional Government in the faraway lands. The Republic of Korea Government has named a new order of peace and co coexistence and also of cooperation and prosperity to be generated to, through complete denuclearization and establishment of the permanent peace of the peninsula, the new Korean Peninsular regime. The new Korean Peninsular regime seeks to be a peace cooperation community moving from war and conflict to peace and coexistence and an economic co cooperation community moving away from ideological camps to economic prosperity. Firstly, for the establishment of the peace cooperation community, the two Koreas will eliminate the risk of war by easing military tensions and building confidence and constructing a foundation for the establishment of the permanent peace on the peninsula. In the near future, when the complete denuclearization and normalization of U.S.-North Korea relations are achieved, the quarter regime on the Korean peninsula will fall and give way to a new regime of peace. The denuclearization and establishment of, pe of the peace regime on the peninsula will conclude the long-standing division and conflict between the two Koreas and become stepping stones for peaceful coexistence and common prosperity. Furthermore, peace on the peninsula is going to facilitate an atmosphere of peace and security cooperation in the Northeast Asia and contribute to the establishment of multilateral peace regime in East Asia. 
the second pillar of the new Korean Peninsula regime, the economic cooperation community, is founded on the peace community. The peace economy refers to a positive cycle of peace and the economy, where peace generates a newfound drive for economic growth and economic cooperation in, in turn generates peace. Peace on the Korean Peninsula and the activation of inter-Korean economic exchange will drive new economic growth not only in, on the Korean Peninsula but also in East Asia and Eurasia as a whole. The common economic body of the two Koreas will be the center of economic cooperation network that connects the Korean Peninsula to Eurasia and the Pacific to the Indian Ocean. The future you know, is a collection of fulfilled present days. The Republic of Korea Ministry of National Defense will do our best to heed today's calling to realize the new Korea Peninsula regime, the future vision of security on the Korean Peninsula. In addition, the ministry will strengthen national defense cooperation with nations in the Asia Pacific region and actively work to e establish common and cooperative peace in East Asia. Distinguished guests, there can sometimes be challenges and difficulties on the road to peninsula of peace and prosperity. However, this is not a cause to gloss over or to evade obstacles. Looking back on the past trajectory of inter-Korean relations, complete denuclearization and the establishment of permanent peace has never been an easy task. Military confrontations and tensions of 70 years will be difficult to transform into complete peace in just 1.5 years. Regardless, this is a road that this is the road that we must take. While progress can be slow, it still must be made continuously and incrementally. We cannot relapse into confrontation and tension. North Korea has fired short-range missile in May and is threatening to derail itself from denuclearization talks to return to the past. On the other hand, North Korea continues to implement the CMA and makes efforts to maintain the frame of dialogue. The most important task now is to recover mutual confidence. We will not stop at our current achievements and continue making improvements to establish denuclearization and of peace through thorough implementation of the CMA, mitigation of inter-Korean military tensions, and building mutual trust. What is undeniable is that the establishment of peace and peace on the Korean Peninsula is a goal sought after by all and one that we cannot relinquish at any given moment. Also, the fact that we hold the last chance this very moment to achieve denuclearization and establish peace on the Korean Peninsula gives us a sense of urgency. What we need right now is a whole halted uh, support and optimism of the Korean international community. The international community needs to assure North Korea that the decision to denuclearize is indeed the right decision and gather its strength so that North Korea may stay on the path of permanent and steadfast peace. No matter how long or challenging the journey may be, the Republic of Korea government seeks to walk this path with you all. We dream of a peaceful peninsula, one without conflict and the fear of war, and an Asia Pacific that pro prospers together. I ask all members of the international community to provide the support and cooperation so that this dream may be realized. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister, very much for your vision of our future Korean uh, peninsula peace and also your reminder that there are still significant challenges to achieve the complete and verifiable uh, nuclear uh, disarmament that's a condition uh, for that. Could I uh, now invite the Minister of Defense of Japan, uh, Takeshi Iwaya. Iwaya-san, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chipman, ladies and gentlemen. I am truly honored to have this opportunity to talk to all of you. I would like to express my gratitude for the invitation to this profound event and deep appreciation for the, for the effort of those people engaged in its preparation, especially distinguished delegates from WIWS and the government of Singapore. The Shangri-La Dialogue is 
an extremely significant occasion for Japan as a platform for engaging with countries that share an interest in the security of the Asia-Pacific region. Before moving on to my discussion about Korean security, I note Secretary Shanahan's comprehensive speech about the security of the Indo-Pacific region. I welcome the strong U.S. commitment to the vision of the free and open Indo-Pacific, or FOIP, as evident in the overview of the Indo-Pacific strategy reports in the previous session. I am most confident that all those present here today share the same vision. The main purpose of FOIP is to consolidate the rule of law in the Indo-Pacific to foster peace and stability, as well as economic prosperity among regional countries. This session's theme, Korean security, the next steps, is integral to this vision. About one year ago, the historic U.S.-North Korea summit took place here in Singapore. I would like to once again express my strong support for the U.S. government's position in urging North Korea to take concrete actions toward the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea must understand the significance of the summit meetings, respond positively to the sincere will of the international community, and make the most of this opportunity. In this regard, North Korea's launching of short-range ballistic missiles at the beginning of May, which violated relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions is extremely regrettable. Japan's position remains absolutely unchanged in seeking the complete, verifiable, and irreversible dismantlement or CVID of all of North Korea's weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missiles of all ranges in accordance with relevant UNSC resolutions. We need to remind ourselves of the undeniable fact that there has been no essential change in North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities. More specifically, North Korea maintains several hundreds operational ballistic missiles which have the whole territory of Japan within their reach. It also possesses ballistic missiles that can possibly reach the mainland U.S. and Europe. The global security risk of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, including biological and chemical weapons, remains unchanged. In consideration of the foregoing, therefore, the most pressing risk is that the collective resolve of the international community abates before North Korea takes concrete steps toward CBIT. Such collective resolve should serve as an important basis for the U.S.-North Korea process that commenced last year. Now is the time to make a concerted effort to free implement 
relevant UNSC resolutions to support this process towards the denuclearization of North Korea. With this in mind, what measures should be undertaken to realize North Korea's denuclearization and to build a favorable regional order? I will now introduce my perspective as a defense minister on this point. First and foremost, I would like to emphasize the fact that peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula is extremely important for Japan. It is worth reiterating that Japan strongly hopes that the denuclearization of North Korea will be peacefully achieved through diplomatic efforts. I would like to note that the role of defense authorities is to firmly support and push forward such diplomatic efforts on denuclearization. First, we need to maintain robust deterrence. Japan will co continue to tirelessly work on initiatives to further strengthen Japan-US and Japan-US ROK cooperation, including joint exercises such as those to enhance ballistic missile warning capability. Also, there is no room for doubt that for the foreseeable future, beyond this particular crucial moment, the steadfast deterrence provided by the U.S. presence in Northeast Asia remain, remains vital to the stability of the region. While a key role of defense authorities is to maintain robust deterrence, another crucial role is sustaining the effectiveness of UNSC resolutions on North Korea. On this point, I would like to underscore the importance of two mutually supporting approaches. These are the reinforcement of international surveillance and regional countries' individual efforts to free implement sanctions. Simply put, we need to enhance surveillance on a global scale while strengthening effort locally to ensure the full implementation of sanctions. These two approaches are like the two wheels of a vehicle working in tandem. A lack of either one of the two means we cannot expect to achieve the full intended effect. To address so-called ship-to-ship transfers, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force and the Japan Coast Guard engage in continued monitoring and surveillance activities at sea to give out warning to suspicious vessels when we find vessels strongly suspected of involvement in ship-to-ship -ship transfers we publicize the relevant information. What is particularly encouraging is that partner countries are increasingly working together to enhance this multinational surveillance approach against ship-to-ship -ship transfers. This includes not only Pacific Ocean littoral countries such as the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, but also European countries such as the UK and France. Beyond its applicability to the North Korean context, this approach is a contribution in the global interest. 
in bringing illicit activity to light. It represents a potential model for multinational maritime surveillance. It can be used to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction or other activities that threaten international peace and security. I pay my respect to the strong unity of the countries undertaking this task and hope that more participants con contribute to such cooperative activity. Although the foregoing represents a firm step forward in multinational surveillance, we recognize that regional countries need to in engage more towards the full implementation of relevant UNSC resolutions on North Korea. This is why I would like to call for further solidarity in support of the global interest with regional countries. These countries include the Republic of Korea, China, and Russia, which have an immense interest in the North Korean issue, and Southeast Asian littoral countries that are located astride key global transportation choke points. In my capacity as a defense minister, I have stated the ways in which to deal with the two challenges facing defense authorities, namely maintaining robust deterrence capabilities and sustaining the effectiveness of relevant UNSC resolutions. I strongly believe that these efforts will support the diplomatic process and I am determined to continue our efforts. The policy of the gov government of Japan on our relations with North Korea remains unchanged. That is, Japan seeks to normalize its relations with North Korea through a comprehensive resolution of outstanding issues of concern, such as abduction issues, nuclear and missile issues, as well as the settlement of the unfortunate past. North Korea enjoys abundant resources and a hard-working labor force. North Korea is well placed to shape a better future if it takes the right path. Japan will be unstinting in our assistance to unleash the potential North Korea holds. Ladies and gentlemen, right now, the international community should take all possible measures to safeguard against contingencies and create an environment that allows for negotiations, negotiations to reach an agreement. I would like to conclude my speech by calling for a closely aligned international community to redouble its efforts toward these objectives. I wish once again to express my gratitude for this opportunity to speak to all of you. I hope my words a prompt and active discussion at the end of this session. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Iwaya-san, uh, uh, domo uh, and particularly for your uh, briefing on the role that the self-defense forces play in uh, the monitoring and surveillance of activities at sea to prevent and uh, denounce illicit ship-to-ship uh, -ship transports and for your uh, very specific appeal uh, 
for wider regional and extra-regional participation uh, in these efforts, which I'm sure we'll discuss uh, more about um, in the Q&A session. Now it's my pleasure to invite uh, Federica Mogherini to address this plenary, giving a European perspective on Korea's security the next steps. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, let me start by saying that it is really a pleasure for me to be, first of all, back in uh, Singapore, uh, but also uh, it's a pleasure to be back uh, to the Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, and uh, especially uh, to be uh, in this panel together with the defense ministers of, uh, I can think I can say, uh, the two uh, most uh, uh, solid partners we have uh, in this region as the European Union with the Republic of Korea and Japan. Um, let me start with um, a personal um, memory. I, as you mentioned, uh, I first came to the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, uh, four years ago uh, in the first year of my mandate. Uh, and I came with one simple message, uh, that Asia's security matters to Europe. And we have the uh, ambition to be not only, as we are already, uh, the key economic partner for Asia, but also uh, that we had the ambition to become a global uh, security provider, a global security partner, uh, and uh, Asia uh, should have been part of that uh, polarization and nothing else. So I very much agree with President Moon when he talks about a new regional security architecture for this part of the world. And he has often mentioned the European Union as an example. Of course, every historical process has its specificity and history never repeats itself in the same shape. But there is always something to learn from others' experiences. And we would be honored to bring our experience to the table. We want to contribute to security and peace in Asia, starting with the work we've done in these years and uh, contributing to uh, the important work that has been done uh, in the Korean Peninsula, because peace and security in Asia matters to Europe. So I'm grateful for our cooperation in these years, and I'm sure that Europe and Asia will be even closer, reliable partners in the years to come. Thank you. Madam Vice President, thank you very much for those uh, uh, remarks and uh, uh, for your reminder near the end that, of course, sanctions uh, will be lifted, but only when an agreement is both uh, reached uh, and uh, implemented, uh, and for your call uh, for uh, a continued multilateral engagement uh, on this very, very uh, difficult task. Uh, the floor is now open. I've got about uh, 11 people who have uh, 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 met the technological challenge of the two-step process of putting their card uh, in and pressing uh, the button. And what I will certainly do in this session is take uh, five or six uh, questions in a group and then come back to the panel uh, and invite them uh, all to take the floor in rough proportion to uh, the number of questions that were specifically directed to uh, one or uh, the other. Um, but uh, given that we've heard uh, a Korean, uh, Japanese, and European perspective, could I first call for a U.S. one from uh, Steve Began, who is the United States uh, Special Envoy for this uh, issue. Steve. Thank you, Dr. Chipman, and uh, thank you to IISS for hosting this excellent dialogue this weekend. I want to thank the uh, ministers of the Republic of Korea and of Japan on behalf of the United States for their strong leadership and their strong partnership with the United States of America. Uh, together, uh, we have made enormous progress, and, and it, it is to a large part because of the leadership of both of your governments. I should also extend that appreciation to the European Union, to High Representative Mogherini. Uh, there may be no issue of national security upon which the United States and the European Union are more closely aligned than the strategic uh, risks that come from nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. I also want to extend uh, credit uh, to the ASEAN nations and other friends and allies uh, in the region, in particular Singapore uh, and uh, Vietnam for hosting two excellent summits last year and this year. I also want to credit the great work that the United States has been able to do with China and Russia, two countries with whom we have many areas of bilateral disagreement, but we have been able to work cooperatively toward our shared goal of peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and the elimination of nuclear weapons uh, from the same. 
It's a work in progress. Uh, there's much more we could be doing. We've heard some examples of that uh, today. But through international cooperation on the enforcement of the UN Security Council resolutions, and through our strong commitment to diplomacy with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, President Trump is confident that Chairman Kim Jong-un will meet the commitments that he made a year ago at a summit here in Singapore. I want to emphasize the commitments we have made to the North Koreans. And we have made these commitments directly and indirectly, privately and publicly. Remain engaged, avoid provocations. The United States is convinced that through continued negotiations, we can continue to close the gaps that separate our two countries and make further progress on all the goals that we committed to in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that um, very authoritative statement, which will uh, help us as we uh, continue uh, these uh, uh, discussions. From uh, Japan, could I invite Tadashi Maeda, Maeda-san? Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Thank you for uh, all panelists that they made the uh, wonderful remarks. However, that uh, listening to that the remarks of the uh, uh, Defense Minister of, of, of Republic of Korea uh, and also Defense Minister of Japan, Mr. Iwaya, in terms of uh, a tone of the uh, recognition on the current situation in North Korea, it's, uh, there's some difference. Uh, Defense Minister of Korea shows it's more uh, idealistic and um, a long-term uh, perspective and uh, uh, more focusing on um, the uh, deconciliatory uh, posture uh, by the President Moon and his uh, administration. On the other hand, uh, Minister uh, Iwaya is more practical and strengthening the uh, countries among the U.S., Japan, and Laro in particular to uh, strengthen the uh, enforcement of UN Security Council resolutions. And my question is that, for the two questions. First question is, um, in beginning of May, North Korea launched the, the short-range ballistic missile. Uh, but media reported that the, the uh, ROK government showed its hesitance to announce the uh, which the flying objective is that the short range ballistic missile. It takes days to uh, announce it's a missile. And it's a kind of hesitation uh, of its recognition. Why? This, uh, this is my first question. And your short second question? Second question is that do, uh, do you bring a, uh, any agenda of the G20 that to have a discussion between the, uh, Japan and, and are okay on the Korean Peninsula? That's a question to both uh, ministers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, could I now ask Amy King? Your microphone is on. Amy King. Thank you, Dr. Chipman. In answer to a question in the previous session, Defence Secretary Shanahan implied that apart from upholding UN Security Council resolutions, there wasn't a particular role for regional countries uh, and US allies and partners on the North Korean nuclear issue. Do Ministers Jung and Iwaya agree, or do you see a greater role for Japan, Korea, China and others on this issue? or even a return to a more multilateral process, as Representative Mogherini has outlined. Thank you. Andrea Berger. Good morning. Uh, thank you for some really clear um, and interesting speeches. We often talk about the threats emanating from the Korean Peninsula as being ones that have the potential to have much wider effects internationally. And I think you really uh, clearly came to the point about the, the threats posed by North Korea's own nuclear program. We often talk about their ability to proliferate weapons further afield as being in that same basket of concerns. But I'd be really interested in your thoughts on uh, the extent to which we've thought perhaps about room for more multilateral cooperation on the DPRK cyber issue, which mm. is one that I think also has the potential to have much far further reaching effects, including 
uh, undermining the sanctions regime and undercutting its effectiveness, but also just uh, damaging the fabric uh, that underpins, for example, the international financial system. Um, so is that an area where our uh, ability for multilateral cooperation has been underexploited, and what could we do more in that area? Thanks very much. And keep Panda. Thank you, Dr. Shipman. Uh, my question is for Minister Zhang. Um, in your speech, you acknowledged the May launches of short-range ballistic missiles by North Korea, and I believe in the next sentence you said North Korea continues to implement the CMA of September 19, 2018. Article 1 of that agreement prohibits both Koreas from engaging in hostile acts against each other. So my question is, were the launches of these long-range artillery systems and short-range ballistic missiles not, in fact, a hostile act under the understanding of the South Korean government's interpretation of the CMA, but are they a cause of concern for the future of that agreement? Thank you. Thank you very much. And the chair of the IISS trustee, Bill Emmett. <coughs> thank you, John. Um, and thank you to all the panelists, uh, echoing what everyone else has said. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, the view of scholars of both non-proliferation and of uh, Korea specifically is that um, the chances of North Korea agreeing to denuclearization are approximately zero. Um, in other words, the general consensus is that uh, the, the whole objective still uh, lacks realism, as uh, um, Representative Mogherini uh, described. Therefore, my questions are two. One is putting disagreement or agreement with that to one side, what intermediate goals do the panel think um, could uh, achieve um, progress and achieve um, real uh, um, steps to de-escalate um, on uh, the Korean Peninsula? And second question, I wonder if you could read the minds of the Chinese government uh, for us and tell us what you believe China's view is of uh, this process and of the objectives that have been laid down uh, by you. Well, perhaps Lang Shen Chang, who now has the microphone from China, can in his question answer that one. Lang Shen. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, I'm Lang Shen Chang from Graduate Institute uh, in Geneva. Uh, I have a question for uh, Madame Mogherini. Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, EU uh, is, uh, intends to increase uh, the role in the Asian uh, Pacific security. I just wonder, um, is that possible? Um, the, uh, the tension, let's say, between uh, US and China today, of course, is, does not start with uh, Trump. Uh, start with Obama already. The, the, during that time, EU seem to have done almost nothing when Obama launched something called Pivot. Um, EU was not there with uh, certainly the original six-party talks, uh, you know, the whole process, Korean Peninsula, not to mention other issues, maritime, Taiwan. Uh, you never done anything. Today, of course, you have a situation where US president says almost nothing good about EU. Uh, <laughs> what, what can you do? to increase that level of participation, aside from ASEAN process. Okay. Um, so this is my, you know, uh, I have little doubt. I, I have just one quick point uh, to Mr. Zhang uh, uh, about the Korean uh, nuclear issue. I think is that realistic now to retreat from the original idea of CVID, maybe lower s some level of uh, for the final deal. It looks increasingly impossible. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a couple of questions on intermediate steps in effect. Uh, let me take one more in this round and then I'll give a couple of minutes each to the three panelists in the order in which they originally spoke. Uh, Tim Huxley. Thank you, John. Uh, my question is for the European Union's High Representative uh, Federica Mogherini. High Representative, uh, you spoke in uh, some uh, very interesting detail about the European Union's aspirations to play a significant role in Asian security. However, it strikes me that there are only two European countries capable of projecting military power globally, the UK and France. 
They are also the two European countries that are permanent members of the UN Security Council and the two European nuclear weapon powers. So my question is, what are the implications of Brexit for the EU's international security role, particularly in relation to this region? Thank you very much. Good, thank you very much. I do hope to return to the floor and ask four or five more people to come in. And in order to do that, I hope that our uh, three panelists can uh, answer crisply the key questions that were posed. And I'll ask first the Minister of Defense of Korea, Minister Jong, uh, can you please pick up uh, the key questions? Thank you. This is the Minister of Republic of Korea. I know that a lot of the experts on national security are interested in uh, securing the current pendants law and that you sincerely want it. Is this certainly a venue to really feel that? So for that, I'd like thank you. So currently there are progressing items uh, and one of them is a short range missile. And there have been a lot of questions with regards to that. For the short range missiles and their launch, the public area government is the agreement to halt active aggression against each other. We have we have been in an official position that acts to raise military tension that has not is not the way to go forward with this process of peace. There are discussions whether or not it's a short range ballistic missile or not. In one's perspective, there is a perspective that it's a Russian Iskandar missile or it's a new tactical mi uh, ballistic missile, but our Republic of Korea government is currently undergoing our analysis. There are points of similarity between the missile and the Iskandar, but there are also marked differences. There are data that we can verify, and we're working off of those data to make sure we have a verification. What is most important is that we support our diplomatic efforts through our military uh, efforts, and so that's where we find the most meaning. in North Korea across all domains, air, land, and sea. In accordance to the CMA, the North Koreans are, in fact, acting within the boundaries of the CMA. And we evaluate that military tensions have been lowered to a significant extent. So currently, the actions done by the North Korean regime It has the intent to carry out the peace process through dialogue and talks, and I believe that that's the hidden intent behind the lines uh, in terms of the, their missile launches. In terms of in terms of the conversations that are going on, there are items about the North Koreans that there are parts that we need to understand about North Korea and the parts that we expect policy changes from with regards to North Korea. And for the Republic of Korea, about North Korea, there is an expectation that we need to step up more as an interested player as opposed to a mediator or referee and participate more actively in the solution of the North Korean nuclear threat, their request for this. And in terms of the Hanoi summit and its uh, lack of agreement, there is that pressure to reach a certain agreement uh, and make progress. And so when it comes down to the launch of the short-range missile, on an international sense, and internally, there are messages that we need to dissect and really analyze to really understand where we stand on the Korea peace process. And so according to what everyone has been giving us in terms of their opinions, we'll, I'll give out the answer. 
I'll point out the meaning that this has to be done through a dialogue and conversation. And in terms of the multilateral involvement on the Korean peace process, on a basic sense, in terms of inter-Korean relations, as well as relationships between the United States and North Korea, it has to be the solutions have to start from those relationships. As more interested players enter the arena, it becomes more harder to reach a coordinated solution. So in, so in the most fundamental sense, it has to be the building of confidence between North Korea and the U.S. and also the same process in an, in an inter-Korean sense as well. But also, not only that, I think it's also for Japan, China, and Russia interested regional players, also the international community, for them to give support and the best wishes that this talks, these talks go pro and make progress, solid progress on the Korean Peninsula for the denuclearization of North Korea. What is notable is that we are acting upon a foundation of aggression that's been existing for the last 70 years. And we're looking to solve this in one year and a half. So that is where a difference of opinion occurs between us and North Korea. But for North Korea, in terms of them looking at economic prosperity, looking into the future, it is important to convince North Korea that this denuclearization process, the peace process, is the only way forward for economic prosperity. And the international community has to support that. And also, when North Korea does achieve complete denuclearization, it is essential to support the possibilities and also the, the stability of their regime on behalf of the international community. And at the center of that, the solution has to become a inter-Korean and also a North Korea-US solution. So that would be my answer to that question. Yes. Uh, uh, I. I have to answer difficult questions, so I'll speak in Japanese. Please use headset. <laughs> first of all, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, the first one that being was that uh, uh, there seems to be uh, some difference uh, of opinion or views uh, between ROK and Japan, and perhaps uh, seemingly so, but the ideals towards the future or the what uh, we want to have in the future uh, is uh, quite identical in my opinion that is uh, the peace and the stability on the Korean Peninsula would uh, be beneficial for not only Japan but also for the entire uh, the region uh, the for the development and the prosperity and uh, uh, President Moon Jae-in and uh, the, his uh, the government uh, the, he made a great effort uh, making the first step forward to which I'd like to pay my uh, deep respect. And uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, the DPRK summit meeting in Singapore made an important uh, step forward uh, about which we have uh, the, uh, the hope and optimism with. But if we end uh, with uh, the uh, realistic uh, the approach now, then uh, there's a risk uh, for us to uh, be reverted to the past. That is a uh, real uh, the concern on my side as well. On the 9th of uh, the May, missiles were launched uh, by the DPRK. And uh, Japan and the United States have the same view. Apparently, they were short-range ballistic missiles in violation of the relevant uh, United Nations uh, the Security Council resolutions. So if that's the case, then we need to make uh, the appropriate response to that. Well, short-range missiles launch are uh, uh, admissible? No. Uh, DPRK shouldn't have uh, the such uh, the uh, mistaken view that uh, the uh, we take uh, a rather uh, lenient uh, uh, attitude toward that, and of course uh, the uh, the uh, for 
the uh, the uh, DPRK and uh, the North Korean issues uh, will be part of the agenda at the upcoming uh, the uh, G20 meeting, although the bilateral uh, meetings uh, haven't been uh, the finalized yet. But uh, anyway, uh, we need to have uh, the have uh, the uh, clear uh, which to uh, take away because we need to have the clear uh, picture about the uh, stocks and of uh, uh, all the stake taking of uh, the nuclear the capabilities of North Korea. Otherwise, we are not sure what to be taken away. Thank you. Federica Mogherini. Thank you. Uh, the EU role in Asia, is it possible to increase it? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll speak in English. <laughs> uh, is it possible to <coughs> increase it? Well, first of all, in this last uh, four years and a half I've seen, uh, it has uh, increased enormously. Uh, I don't know if this is related to a change in the US administration or not, uh, but I am, I am sure, I know, I see. Uh, that uh, EU-Asia uh, relations, being it with ASEAN countries, with ASEAN as such, or with other partners in uh, Asia, uh, the closest one, uh, the most difficult ones, in all cases, it has increased enormously on, I would say, th four uh, different uh, elements. One is trade, that is obvious, but we have concluded in this year's uh, um, some very important agreements, starting from Singapore, uh, but Japan is another case in point, uh, and uh, uh, negotiating with Vietnam, others. Our trade agreements with Asia are uh, increasing. Political cooperation, uh, again, here we've concluded agreements, but our dialogue with our partners, again, the most like-minded ones and the less like-minded ones, uh, is incre has increased already. Uh, enormously. Uh, we just had a very successful summit with China uh, in Brussels uh, a couple of uh, um, a month ago or so. Uh, so trade, political cooperation, security. Security is not only defense. I know there are many militaries in the room, but uh, uh, I think we all agree that today security issues are related also to uh, more soft security uh, elements. Take counter-terrorism, uh, prevention of radicalization, take cyber security, uh, take even climate change or environmental issues. They are all linked to our security environment and the European Union is clearly a key partner for Asia in this field, has become, is becoming one. And last but not least, defense proper, because uh, it's true, uh, the European Union has always been perceived and is always proud to be a soft power in the world, uh, but we have developed in the last especially two and a half years uh, a defense capability as the European Union as such uh, that was not there before. Um, this is also creating some anxiety somewhere, uh, but we're doing it uh, uh, in close cooperation with our friends and allies, starting from the United States, from our partners uh, in NATO, uh, from the UN system, uh, but we are developing our defense capabilities as the European Union as never before uh, to put this at the service of peace and cooperation to the European way to security I would say so our partnership our cooperation uh, with Asia is increasing also in the field of defense and I think I mentioned a couple of concrete examples in my introductory remarks uh, that I would not repeat uh, and uh, our role specifically on the DPRK uh, dossier, as uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, Special Representative mentioned, uh, is already excellent. I think we are cooperating very well. Um, there are some issues, a uh, limited number of uh, issues, on which we do not see eye to eye uh, with the current U.S. administration uh, when it comes to some crisis uh, uh, management uh, files. But definitely, uh, you take Afghanistan, you take the PRK, definitely Asia is one of the places where our cooperation with the United States uh, is uh, um, the most uh, effective and cooperative one. So. Our uh, willingness to be ready to support is not an ambition, uh, is uh, we have enough to do also closest to home, uh, but it's an availability to help. If there are elements that can be useful, that we can contribute with, we are ready to do so. Uh, and we discuss this uh, regularly, not only in Washington, uh, but also uh, in Seoul, uh, in Tokyo, and uh, uh, other capitals uh, in the region. Uh, let me say that uh, Brexit, we will see when it happens, uh, what effects it will have. Uh, for the moment, I'm afraid the effect uh, is more on the UK than on the rest of the Union. Uh, 
Um, but still the UK is the rest of the Union. I mean, uh, I still chair a council uh, with 28 member states. We still take decisions by unanimity in foreign and defence policy issues uh, at 28, where the UK is full uh, member and a cooperative member, in particular in, in foreign and uh, uh, security issues. Um, I would not comment on internal uh, domestic politics uh, of the UK. Um, but for the time being, uh, I do not see any effect uh, on the uh, capacity of the European Union uh, to work on foreign uh, security and defence issues uh, globally uh, because of this uh, process. I, I, I see and I regret it is happening that this is weakening UK's role in the world, but I think it doesn't affect uh, the European Union uh, role in the world. Um, and I would not comment on the fact that only two EU member states uh, have the um, capability to project uh, military power globally uh, because I guess uh, the other 26 uh, might feel rather offended by this statement. I come myself from a country that I believe has some capabilities. Uh, and uh, most of them are members of NATO, allies in NATO, and uh, they definitely uh, have some military capabilities. But again, uh, this is uh, a matter for member states to comment upon. But uh, the European Union as such, again, we're proud to be a soft power. We're proud to focus on uh, um, other issues as well, including human rights and economics, prosperity and cooperation. Uh, but uh, uh, the Coming from Venus, coming from Mars, uh, debate uh, has long gone. Uh, we are now also a defense uh, um, player, um, not only regionally but globally as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do now, we will close at 10 past 11, so I'm going to ask uh, four people to make really brief statements, and then I'll allow each of our three uh, panelists to make one concluding statement to uh, draw what they think is the most uh, important point out uh, of this session. So from France, uh, uh, and the Quai d'Orsay, Alexandre Escortia. Yes, thank you very much. Um, very brief indeed, Minister Zhang, uh, and building on uh, Mr. Emmert's question. Minister Zhang, you said this time um, North Korea-US negotiations would be different. Um, could you tell us maybe, um, based on your insights, maybe on the system, North Korean system, you may know, why this time should be different? Thank you. Thank you. And from Indonesia, the former Vice Foreign Minister, Dino uh, Patay Dajal. Dino. Yeah. Uh, thank you. On the question of uh, sanctions, uh, uh, Mr. Awai Iwaya and uh, uh, Ms. Federica called for greater sanctions. Uh, I visited North Korea last year, and my observation was that the sanctions had very limited impact. Uh, hmm. One is they were used to hardship, and they were not able to compare this to a better life before because uh, they were really at the, the bottom of things. And secondly, uh, there was the factor of great pride and, and the sanction reinforced the narrative of siege mentality uh, that uh, uh, North Korea was uh, surrounded by, by hostile forces. So my question was to, is to the Minister of uh, South Korea, uh, your, your President has call for easing of sanctions very actively. So uh, what ca can you explain to us uh, mm -hmm. what is the logic uh, behind this? Is this a matter of political expediency uh, to maintain good relations with the North? Or do you see something that others, your allies, don't see that easing of sanctions would help move forward the process to, uh, so that North Korea would behave more according uh, to what we like them to do? Thank you very much. You and Graham. My question is also for um, Minister Jong of the Republic of Korea. Minister, in your um, comments, your framing of Korean security referred to East Asia, the Asia Pacific, and interestingly, Eurasia. I didn't hear the Indo Pacific as part of that, and I wonder if you can explain to us whether Korea uh, does support the notion of a free and open. Indo-Pacific and see it as a, uh, itself as a member of that, given um, the statements that we've had at length from uh, the United States and your Japanese counterpart this morning. Thank you. And from uh, uh, Korea and the WIWS, Chung Min Lee. Oh, thank you, John. 
My question is to the Defense Minister uh, Iwaya from Japan. Thank you, Minister, for your excellent overview of what's happening on the Korean Peninsula. How confident are you in your government's intelligence on the domestic uh, plays within North Korea today? We hear press reports that Kim Jong-un has ordered the execution of several members of the foreign ministry who are responsible for the Hanoi summit. Are you very confident moving forward that you have very good intelligence on what is happening within North Korea? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dong Xiao Chen. Thank you. Uh, my question will be to Minister Jong. I know that uh, ROK has tried very hard to play the role of bridging and narrowing the gap of perception between the Washington and Pyongyang in the past. How would you uh, take the uh, assessment of uh, your role, whether it is uh, successful or not, particularly following the Hanoi summit? What kind of change of shift do you believe that uh, such kind of uh, role would have played by your side? Uh, William Chung in Singapore. Go ahead, William. Yep, thank you very much, uh, John. I have one question for the Japanese minister. Uh, thank you, minister, for saying it as it is and saying that there's no essential change uh, with regards to the Korean Peninsula. And I have to ask you this question again. Like, what what has to happen actually on the peninsula and for Japan to actually think seriously about giving up its three nuclear nose policy on, on nuclear weapons? Thank you very much. Thank you. And from Japan, Toshia Umahara. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chipman. Um, my question is, is for two defense ministers and um, there are uh, the, the bilateral relations between the two government, two countries are Chile and uh, there's a lack of dialogue and uh, based on historical disagreement and, and territorial disputes. And how can Republic of, Republic of Korea and Japan can avoid these disagreements uh, escalating into uh, becoming an obstacle against the, the maintenance of unity vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea. And the final question, and then I'll give one minute each to each of our panelists. Antoine Levesque. You just turned off your microphone, I think. Oh. There you go. Back you are. Go. Um, my question is for High Representative Mogherini. Um, to what extent does the EU face a choice between engaging India as uh, an Indian Ocean and Indo-Pacific um, uh, power on the one hand and engaging um, island states and regional Indian Ocean states on capacity building and non-traditional security matters. Is there a choice here or can both be um, uh, carried out in parallel? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll now turn again to our three panelists if you have about a minute each to give us your strongest message you can uh, on the future of security on the Korean Peninsula and the next steps uh, to achieve that aim. Korean Defense Minister. With regards to the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia, with the conclusion of the Second World War, There's a there's an implementation uh, there's an imprint of the Cold War dynamic that is imprinted on the, upon the region. While it has been dissipated by a significant amount since then, the Cold War regime still remains on the Korean Peninsula. The North Koreans cannot have diplomatic relations with Japan or the United States, and for the last one and a half years, a short amount of time, in my opinion. It has been a significant challenge for us to make sure that we abridge, that we bridge together all the tensions that have been happened over the last 70 years. So when it comes to the denuclearization of North Korea, there's some efforts towards that. And for the Hanoi summit between the U.S. and North Korea, while it has not reached an agreement at that time, for sure they have been able to probe where their interests lie. So between the two leaders, there's been also an opportunity to establish more confidence. And so I believe that this, is, this was a good result for maintaining the momentum of dialogue. And so f 
to maintain absolutely North Korea on, on the track towards denuclearization, the Republic of Korea government will do all that we can, our utmost, to make sure that this happens. Our government, especially President Moon, is absolutely doing uh, our best to set us apart from the pa uh, past policies to uh, enact our current policies. And for us, it's also a matter about sticking to the UNSCRs. However, when, however, it will be an effort to make sure to lead North Korea into conversation away from going back to the ways of the past in terms of engaging in aggression against us. So in terms of doing that, humanitarian aid and lowering of military tensions, those measures will also be considered. Amongst that, when North Korea does launch short-range missiles, the combined defense posture of the Rockius Alliance is solid and is remain, it remains ready to defend our country. So therefore, the two, co two countries, the two governments are sh actively sharing our positions on the issue. So, and also on the point of the Indo-Pacific region and our posture on that, we absolutely support a rules-based order and the international uh, legal system. I think this is not something that we are alone on. I think we join a community of nations in doing that. And for cooperation and coexistence, uh, I think that's the way we really need to go in terms of achieving peace and prosperity. The Republic, the Republic of Korea government the, will continue our cooperation, especially with regards to the Rockius Alliance, the strongest alliance, I believe, in my opinion, in the, in the world. We will continue our cooperation with various nations in, 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 the, in the Pacific region, Asia Pacific, Northeast Asia and make sure that there is a rule-based order where the interests of all indiv individual involved nations are guaranteed. The Republic of Korea Ministry of National Defense will work on lowering military tensions and maintain the momentum of dialogue. Thank you so much. Minister of Japan. Hi. Hello. The, thank you uh, very much. Uh, the, uh, some said that uh, the uh, sanctions are not very effective or the sanctions that are might be counter effective. I think that's the gist of uh, the views that have been just shared. But uh, we need both in order to solve uh, DPRK issues, pressure and dialogue. That's our position. And I repeated the importance of uh, the uh, measures against uh, the ship-to-ship -ship transfer. Well, uh, the uh, modus operandi have been very complicated and uh, the uh, sophisticated when it comes to the ship-to-ship uh, 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 -ship, uh, operations. But we believe that uh, the sanctions have been working effective. At the same time, dialogue important. Dialogue between the inter-Koreans, dialogue uh, the, uh, between inter-Korean dialogue, uh, dialogue between in the United States and uh, uh, the DPRK and dialogue uh, the, uh, between uh, the, uh, China and uh, DPRK and the dialogue uh, uh, between uh, Russia and the DPRK. Uh, so as I said, uh, the pressure will continue while the uh, several tracks of the dialogue should also continue to be pursued. When it comes to the internal situation of the DPRK, yes, uh, have uh, the, uh, been uh, learned uh, the through uh, media, uh, but uh, apparently the uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, strong grip uh, on uh, the domestic situations uh, the, is very solid. So the, uh, he uh, is the key. Without him, uh, nothing could be changed. So that's nothing could be decided. That's why we need to engage and uh, talk with him in order to go ahead. And uh, our Japan's uh, the, uh, three uh, principle, three non-nuclear principles remain the same. Uh, the, uh, not to uh, possess, not to manufacture, or uh, not to bring in uh, the uh, nuclear weapons uh, into the Japanese territories. Well, uh, if the North Korea is liberated and uh, to develop in the future, well, uh, that uh, the uh, strong support from many countries uh, would uh, be necessary. 
And so any uh, difference of tones of views, uh, they must be talked over and uh, they overcome in order to uh, address the future issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last word to Federica Mogherini. Thank you. First of all, I owe a direct uh, answer to the question that was uh, asked. Yes, it is possible for us to carry out uh, uh, both in parallel. Uh, and thanks for mentioning India, because this is one of the countries with whom we've worked uh, more in this uh, uh, recent years and well, and uh, relations have improved enormously. Uh, so thank you for um, allowing me to remind that all also. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, to conclude by coming back uh, uh, to the question that was uh, um, put in the previous round. Um, uh, chances are zero. Uh, I think uh, um, to, to quote Nelson Mandela, it always looks impossible until it's done, uh, and this is uh, uh, no exception. Uh, every negotiation uh, uh, always seems to be leading nowhere until uh, the day, sometimes the day after the negotiation is ended, uh, and you realize that you have actually uh, managed to, uh, to get where everybody thought it was impossible to be. Uh, and it is indeed uh, extremely uh, difficult, uh, possibly unlikely, uh, but I think that uh, the, the mix of three different elements could lead somewhere. First of all, the mix of uh, pressure and dialogue uh, from the international community. Uh, on the basis of, as the minister said, uh, a cooperative rules-based global order where every single player contributes to the implementation of the common decisions. Second, the awareness of the strong link between the inter-Korean dialogue and the US DPRK process. I think this is the weakest, probably, uh, element of the chain uh, that risks to be broken uh, at every single step. And this is probably the specificity of this negotiation that is making it so complex. And third, uh, the role for, for, the, for the others in the international community, because clearly here there is again, as I said, one specific inter-Korean dimension that belongs only to the two sides and can belong only to the two sides. There's a specific uh, Pyongyang-Washington dynamic uh, that we all see, recognize, and uh, needs to be there. But uh, I believe that, uh, and I'll close on that, if we uh, increase the number of reasons for all the players that have a stake in the process, to find it convenient to make it succeed. And we lower the number of potential spoilers inside and outside of the process. Then I think we facilitate uh, and we create a better environment for success to come. This is why we insist on the multilateral framework, not because we aspire to uh, any kind of specific role, but simply because we <coughs> think it is more uh, likely to succeed uh, a process as difficult as this one um, if uh, the number of players in the region and beyond that can contribute to creating a positive environment uh, is uh, uh, bigger than two. Um, this is why uh, I believe that uh, in practice, we are already coordinating uh, to a large extent uh, uh, in this process, and this is why I wouldn't say that chances are zero. Uh, there might be one, but you can still get it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, close this session with uh, uh, two brief comments. Uh, first, um, uh, I should say that the IISS um, headquartered in the UK uh, will launch uh, a new project, the Missile Dialogue Initiative, actually with support from the German uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the aim of this initiative is to uh, engage in an international track 1.5 dialogue and to provide first-class analysis to enable um, government-to-government -government conversations on missile technology, regional security dynamics and trends in missile uh, proliferation. So uh, we hope uh, effectively to contribute to that wider international uh, dialogue because questions of missile proliferation uh, in Europe and Asia are, are diplomatically and operationally linked, uh, as uh, we all know. Uh, secondly, uh, and before I thank our speakers, to remind all of you to uh, return to the hall in 20 minutes for the third plenary, but you'll only be able to get back in the hall if you take your uh, name badges out of the microphone, re-clip them back on your uh, uh, neck, and then uh, come back for that purpose. And with that reminder, could I please uh, ask you all to join me in thanking our three panelists for a tremendous presentation. Thank you very much. Ben, <laughs> thank you very much.